नमस्कार वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन परस्पेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज आर एस रघु एंड विद मी इज निशित कुमार ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर As the world fights the COVID-19 pandemic, we begin with a message of caution to stay safe and protected by following these three simple steps: wear a face mask, maintain do maintain social distancing, focus on hand and face hygiene. The headlines: India and Kuwait establish joint commission to enhance and deepen bilateral relationship. European Union joins the coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure. Italy joins the International Solar Alliance. China and the US to conduct first in-person meeting under the Biden administration in Alaska. Swarnam Vijay Mashal, the victory flame of the Golden Jubilee celebrations of the 1971 Bangladeshi Liberation War reaches all India radio premises in Kolkata. India's Nikhat Zareen stuns world champion Ekaterina Polseva to enter the women's 51 kg quarterfinals at Bosphorus Boxing Tournament and PV Sindhu beats Christopherson of Denmark to enter quarterfinals of All England Open Badminton Championships. External Affairs Minister of India Dr S J Shankar and Foreign Minister of Kuwait Sheikh Dr Ahmad Nasir Al Mohammad Al Sabha met on Thursday. The two ministers reviewed all aspects of India Kuwait bilateral relationship and discussed regional developments. They also explored ways and means to impart further dyma- dynamism in the traditional and friendly ties between the two countries. Sheikh Dr Ahmad Nasir was on a two-day visit to India. The Foreign Minister of Kuwait also handed over a letter to Dr Jayashankar from Kuwait's Prime Minister Sheikh Sabha Khalid Al Hamad Al Sabha addressed to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Sheikh Dr Ahmad Nasir thanked India for supplying Kuwait with 2 lakh doses of made in India Covishield vaccines last month. Dr Jayashankar thanked the leadership and the government of Kuwait for hosting a large Indian community in Kuwait and taking care of them during COVID-19 pandemic. He hoped that Indian community will be able to resume travel to Kuwait in larger numbers soon. He also expressed India's continued support to Kuwait in its fight against COVID-19 pandemic. Both sides emphasized the need to enhance cooperation in the area of health security. India and Kuwait have decided to establish a joint commission to enhance and deepen the ties of fraternity and friendship and support ways of cooperation in all fields. In a joint statement on Thursday, the two sides said the joint commission meeting will be held regularly to review all bilateral matters. Joint commission will be charged with formulating the required basis to strengthen the relations between the two countries particularly in the fields of energy trade economy investment and human resources it will be co-chaired by external affairs minister dr s j shankar and his kuwait counterpart the joint commission meeting will be held in each country alternately at a mutually agreed time india and kuwait enjoyed traditionally friendly relations underlined by geographic proximity historical trade links and cultural affinities kuwait also has a large presence of indian nationals india has administered over 371 million vaccine doses in the country so far the union health minister said that more than 2.78 million people were inoculated with covid-19 doses in the last 24 hours meanwhile the country's covid-19 recovery rate reached 96.41% with a total recovery of more than 17000 patients in the last 24 hours the minister said that more than 1 crore 10 lakh patients have already recovered from this disease a total number of 35871 new cases were reported in the country in the past 24 hours taking the cumulative posit- positive cases to over 1 crore 14 lakhs 172 deaths were also reported during the last 24 hours taking the toll to over 1 lakh 59000 now let us take a look at the coronavirus updates from around the world 
Taiwan has given regulatory approval to AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine. Health Minister Chen Xiu Chung made the announcement on Wednesday. The minister said that Taiwan is prioritizing health workers in the first wave of its vaccination program and about 60,000 people are in the line to get the first vaccinations. On Wednesday, the World Health Organization WHO said it was also carrying out an investigation into the blood clots in AstraZeneca vaccine recipients. However, the WHO recommended that countries continue to Minister Jabs as they deem the benefits to outweigh the costs. European Commission's President Ursula von der Leyen outlined the proposal, the Digital Green Certificate, on Wednesday to reopen access to international travel and leisure activities. Ms. von der Leyen announced that the pass will be free of charge, bilingual in the language of the issuing member state, and English, secure, non discriminatory, and available in digital or paper format. She said that the pass will include a QR code to ensure security and authenticity. The Digital Green Certificate will be a proof that the person has been vaccinated received a negative test result or recovered from COVID-19. However, the Commission said that the member states remained responsible to decide what restrictions to lift for travellers. Bulgaria has announced nationwide restrictions as the number of infections rise. Schools, restaurants and shopping malls will remain closed for 10 days from the 22nd of March, according to reports. The Japanese government's advisory panel has approved a plan to let the state of emergency expire in the Tokyo area as scheduled on the 21st of March. Meanwhile, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, Australia's population has declined for the first time in more than a century. The development was owing to the pandemic-induced border closures stemmed the flow of overseas migrants, according to reports. It added that the drop in population was because of this factor rather than COVID-related deaths. VC Pramod for World News, All India Radio. This is All India Radio giving you the news. For quick news updates around the clock, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. Three steps to stay protected and stay safe from COVID-19. Wear face mask, do gaz ki duri to maintain social distancing, maintain hand and face hygiene. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson thanked Prime Minister Narendra Modi for the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure Initiative. In a video message, he also said he is looking forward to his visit in, to India in April. I want to thank Prime Minister Modi for hosting this conference and also for his fantastic leadership in areas such as renewable energy as we continue the fight against climate change. We have a shared vision for a sustainable future for our nations and for the global community. And I very much look forward to discussing this and many other issues with Prime Minister Modi on my upcoming visit to India. If our battle with COVID-19 has taught us anything over the past year, it's that we must be ready for whatever challenges may be coming next. Meanwhile, the European Union has officially joined the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI. In a statement, the EU said the CDRI is a welcome initiative which will help implementation of the Paris Agreement. The statement added that 27 member EU looks forward to exploring synergies and combining forces with CDRI in this respect. The Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI, aims at promoting rapid development of resilient infrastructure to respond to the Sustainable Development Goals. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed the opening ceremony of the International Conference on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure on Tuesday. The year 2021 promises to be a year of swift recovery from the pandemic. The lessons from the pandemic, however, must not be forgotten. They apply to not only public health disasters, but other disasters as well. Italy has signed the International Solar Alliance under the amended ISA Framework Agreement. The amendments to the Framework Agreement of the ISA entered into force, opening its membership to all member states of the UN. The External Affairs Ministry said the Framework Agreement was signed by Italy's Ambassador Vincenzo De Luca. Foreign Secretary Harshwardhan Shringla met Italian Ambassador to India Vincenzo De Luca and welcomed Italy's accession to International Solar Alliance. We also discussed Italy's G20 Presidency and Vaccine Maitri. The International Solar Alliance was launched jointly by the Indian Prime Minister and the French President during the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference or COP21 in Paris. It aims to contribute to the implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement through rapid and massive deployment of solar energy. 
Foreign Secretary of the UK Dominic Raab on Wednesday delivered his first foreign policy speech. He based his speech on the UK's Integrated Review 2021 released earlier by the country. In his speech, Mr. Raab referred to the Indo-Pacific tilt as was described in the Integrated Review. We'll adapt our defence posture to the new shift in the balance of the world towards the Indo-Pacific region. And you'll be able to see that this year with HMS Queen Elizabeth leading a, a British and allied task force to the region. The Indo-Pacific tilt refers to the increased salience of the region in the UK's foreign policy. Last week, the four countries of India, Australia, Japan and the US met virtually in the Quad Virtual Summit and resolved to collaborate towards a free, open and rule-based Indo-Pacific. China's top diplomat Yang Zhexi and State Councillor Wang Yi will meet the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on Thursday and Friday in Anchorage, Alaska. While the Chinese government has said it hoped the two countries would meet halfway, the White House has signaled it would likely continue the tough stance laid out by the previous administration. Our Beijing correspondent has filed this report. The United States and China will face a new test in their travel relations when top officials from both the countries meet in Alaska. This will be the first meeting of senior officials from both countries since U.S. President Joe Biden took office in January. The meeting comes against the backdrop of the first Quad Summit, followed by high-level visits by U.S. officials to Japan and South Korea in a show of commitment from Biden administration to its allies in the Indo-Pacific region. While U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will attend the Alaska meeting having just come from Japan and South Korea, the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin will arrive in India on Friday to discuss a range of issues including a free, prosperous and open Indo-Pacific. Recently, U.S. side has also accused China of using coercion and aggression to undermine human rights in Hong Kong and Xinjiang and assert its claims to Taiwan and the South China Sea. Reacting to this series of meetings and visits, China said that it is opposed to any sort of exclusive bloc and hoped that it will not disturb regional stability. Both the US and China have played down expectations for this talk. While China characterizes the meeting as a high-level strategic dialogue, the US said it would be an opportunity to talk to China directly and share the concerns of US and its allies. Looking at the statements from both the sides, the state looks set for a tough first face-to-face -face meeting. Anshman Mishra, for World News, All India Radio, Beijing. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, said on Thursday that both pressure and diplomatic options are on the table for dealing with North Korea. Mr. Blinken said this hours after a senior North Korean diplomat rejected U.S. overtures for talks until Washington changed its policies. The U.S. Secretary of State is on a visit to South Korea. In a statement, the U.S. State Department said that North Korea poses a serious threat to international peace and security and the global non-proliferation regime. It asserted that the U.S. is committed to strengthening deterrence against the denuclearization of North Korea as well as the protection and promotion of human rights in North Korea. BSF BGB Maitri football match series began from Tripura's Bellonia in South Tripura district on Thursday. India's border security force BSF is organizing the friendly football match series with the border guards Bangladesh to mark the celebration of 50 years of the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War. A large crowd coming from bordering areas of both the countries enthusiastically witnessed the match. A dog show and a colourful cultural dance show were also showcased. The Golden Jubilee celebrations of the 1971 war across the nation continue with the Victory Flame has reached the Akashwani Bhavan in Kolkata on Thursday. The head of Office of All India Radio Kolkata, Deputy Director General Anima Das Devnath, received the Swarnim Vijay Mashal. More from our Kolkata correspondent. Celebrations of the Swarnim Vijay Varsh had been launched on 1st of March from Delhi by lighting up the Swarnim Vijay Mashal from the eternal flame of National War Memorial. Four Vijay Mashals were further lit from it and sent to various parts of the country. The victory flame started its journey in Kolkata from Netaji Bhavan, the house of the great freedom fighter Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, and later travelled to places including Science City, Victoria Memorial and Akashbani Bhavan, Kolkata. A short movie clip commemorating the 1971 war was also screened for the audience along with band display. The brass band of Assam Regiment, who usually performs on Republic Day, played tunes including Dhanodhanna Pushpa Bhara and mesmerized the audience. On 
On culmination of the events in Kolkata, the Victory Flame will also be traveling to Bangladesh on the occasion of the neighboring country's Independence Day celebration on 26th of this month. The Swarnim Vijay Bursh celebrations will finally conclude at Delhi on 26th of December this year. Mudhuparna Dhatrodhuri from Kolkata for World News. Three persons were killed and 11 wounded when a roadside bomb hit a bus carrying Afghan government employees in Kabul on Wednesday. Kabul police spokesman confirmed the casualty figures but gave no further details. The bombing comes on the day the Afghan government, Taliban and key countries including the United States and Russia gather in Moscow to push for reduction in violence to propel the Afghan peace process forward. In another development from Afghanistan, nine Afghan security force members were killed in a helicopter crash in central Afghanistan on Wednesday. A defense ministry statement on Thursday said that they were investigating the crash which took place in Maidan Warak province and the dead included crew members and special force personnel. The extended Troika, Troika on peaceful settlement in Afghanistan welcomed the UN's role in the Afghanistan peace process. In a joint statement, the Troika said that they do not support the restoration of the Islamic Emirate. This is according to the UN Security Council Resolution 2513 and the parties called on the government of Afghanistan and the High Council for National Reconciliation to engage openly with the Taliban counterpart regarding a negotiated settlement. The extended Troika met on Thursday in Moscow and was attended by representatives of Russia, China, the USA and Pakistan. Tanzania's President John Magufuli passed away at the age of 61 at a hospital in Dar es Salaam on Wednesday. In a televised address, Vice President Samia Suluhu Hassan said the President died of a heart ailment that he has battled for over 10 years. She added that the President had been receiving treatment at Mazina Hospital since Sunday. The Vice President announced 14 days of national mourning. According to the African country's constitution, Ms. Hassan will be sworn in as the new President and should sir, the remainder of the Magufuli's five-year term, which he began last year. While a date for her swearing-in has not been announced, she will be Tanzania's first female president. The UN Human Rights Council adopted the report of the Third Universal Periodic Review, UPR, for the United States on Wednesday. The UPR process is designed to ensure that every nation is subject to scrutiny of its human rights record and all UN member states participate in it. The USA had earlier announced its intention to return to UNHRC and seek election to its membership. In a statement, the White House said that the step demonstrates the commitment of the U.S. to openness, transparency and self-reflection and a written to leadership with confidence, respect and humility. In her first address at the United Nations, Vice President of the United States of America, Kamala Harris, spoke about democracy and its connection with women's equality. Speaking at the 65th session of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, Harris said that the status of women is the status of democracy. The United States re-engaged as a member state and leader in the World Health Organization, and we are revitalizing our partnership with UN Women to help empower women worldwide. Eleanor Roosevelt, who shaped the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, once said, without equality, there can be no democracy. In other words, the status of women is the status of democracy. For our part, the United States will work to improve both. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. Welcome back. President Ramnath Kovin said that India enjoys warm and friendly relations with Fiji, Dominican Republic, Afghanistan and Guyana, and the ties are deeply rooted in a common vision of peace and prosperity. He was speaking at the virtual ceremony wherein he accepted credentials from the ambassadors and high commissioners from these countries on Thursday. The President thanked their governments for supporting India's candidature for the non-permanent seat of the UN Security Council for the term 2021-22. In the remarks, the ambassadors and high commissioners from Fiji, Dominican Republic, Afghanistan and Guyana highlighted the excellent relations the countries share with India. They conveyed the resolve of their leaderships to strengthen them further. They thanked India for continued development assistance and support in capacity building across diverse areas. They also expressed their gratitude to India for the humanitarian gesture of supplying COVID-19 vaccines to their countries. India's Minister for Health and Family Welfare, Dr. Harshwadhan, was appointed as the chairman of the international body 
top TV partnership board on Thursday. He was appointed in recognition of his outstanding contribution to the movement to eradicate tuberculosis from India by 2025. Dr. Harshwardhan will serve a three-year term commencing from July this year. The Stop TB Partnership is a unique international body with the power to align actors all over the world in the fight against TB. The participation of a wide range of constituencies gives this global body the credibility and the broad range of medical, social and financial expertise needed to defeat TB. The partnership's vision is a TB-free world. The appointment of Dr. Harshwardhan as the chair of this prestigious global body is a proud recognition of India's political commitment to the eradication of TB. Established in the year 2000, the Stop TB Partnership is mandated to eliminate tuberculosis as a public health program. Problem India is supplying a second batch of 20,000 litres of Malathion 95% ULV pesticide to Iran. The supply was done under a government-to-government locust control program. The consignment reached Chabahar port and was handed over to Iran on Thursday. In a statement, the External Affairs Ministry informed that India had approached Iran and Pakistan for a coordinated regional response to the threat of approaching swarms of desert locusts. It was in this context that Iran had requested the supply of pesticides. There was no response from Pakistan. India supplied the first tranche of 20,000 litres of Malathion to Iran in June 2020. Indigenously built Indian naval landing craft utility L-58 was commissioned into the Indian Navy at Port Blair, Andaman and Nicobar Islands at Port Blair on Thursday. The LCU-58 is an amphibious ship which can carry 160 troops in addition to its crew. In a statement, the Defence Ministry said that the LCU-58 would be based at Port Blair and will be deployed in a variety of roles such as beaching, search and rescue, disaster relief, coastal patrol and surveillance operations amongst others. It added that it will augment the Indian Navy's mobility, reach and flexibility, furthering the Andaman and Nicobar Commando's motto, Victory Through Jointness. Prime Minister Narendra Modi congratulated Prime Minister of Netherlands Mark Rutte for leading his party to be the largest in the parliamentary elections in the Netherlands. In a tweet, Mr. Modi said he is looking forward to work with the new government of the Netherlands to further deepen the multifaceted and broad-based cooperation. Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte led his People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, VVD, to a fourth victory in a row. Moving on to sports, India's Nikhat Zarin stunned reigning world champion Ekatera Napal Seva to breeze into the women's 51 kg quarterfinals at the Bosphorus Boxing Tournament in Istanbul, Turkey. The Asian Championship's bronze medalist Zarin caused a major upset on the second day of the tournament yesterday when she outpunched the Russian boxer 5-0. The Indian pugilist will have yet another tough bout ahead as she takes on two-time world champion Kezabe Nazim of Kazakhstan in her last eight bout. Apart from Zareen, 2013 Asian champion Shiva Thapa, Sonia Lade and Purveen have also registered victories in their respective categories to proceed to the quarter-finals. In badminton, Indian shuttler PV Sindhu entered the women's single quarter-final in the All-England Open Badminton Championships. PV Sindhu defeated L. Christopherson of Denmark 21-8 and 21-8. In men's singles, Lakshya Sain has entered the quarter-final beating Thomas Roussel of France 21-18, 21-17. However, H.S. Pranoy and Sai Pranit lost their men's singles pre-quarter-final matches today. Pranoy lost to top seed Kento Momuta of Japan, 21-15-21-14, while Praneet went down 21-15-21-12-21 to world number 2 Victor Axelsen of Denmark. Samir Verma will take on Anders Antonsen of Denmark later today. In mixed doubles, the duo of Ashwini Ponappa and Satvik Saira Jangi Reddy also lost their second round match to Yuki Kaniko and Misaki Matsutomo of Japan. In men's doubles, pair of Chirag Shetty and Satvik Sairaj Rangireddy will take on Danish duo of Kim Astrup and Anders Rasmussen. In women's doubles, Ashwini Ponnapa and N. Sikki Reddy will face the pair of Gabriela Stoeva and Stefani Stoeva from Bulgaria. In cricket, India set a target of 186 runs for England in the fourth 
टी ट्वेंटी मैच अगेंस्ट इंग्लैंड एट द नरेंद्र मोदी स्टेडियम इन अहमदाबाद इंडिया स्कोर्ड 185 रन्स एट द लॉस ऑफ एट विकेट्स इन द स्टिपुलेटेड ट्वेंटी ओवर्स अर्लियर इंग्लैंड वन द टॉस एंड इलेक्टेड टू बोल फॉर द होस्ट सूर्य कुमार यादव स्कोर्ड फिफ्टी सेवन रन एंड फॉर द विजिटर्स जोफ्रा आर्कर टूक फोर विकेट्स द इंग्लिश आर ऑलरेडी टू वन अप इन द फाइव मैच सीरीज द फिफ्थ एंड द फाइनल टी ट्वेंटी मैच विल बी प्लेड ऑन सैटरडे एट द सेम वेन्यू Equity benchmarks today declined more than 1% amid profit booking. The BSE Sensex closed below 49,500 mark, while the NSE Nifty settled below 14,600 level. The rupee appreciated two paise against the US currency. A report from the business world. The Sensex fell 585 points or 1.17 percent to trade at 49,217. The NSE Nifty at the National Stock Exchange also declined 163 points, that is 1.11 percent to trade at 14,558. The broader market at BSC also fell, underperforming the Sensex. The BSC Mid Cap Index plunged 1.33 percent, while the BSC Small Cap Index tumbled 1.58 percent. In the Sensex pack, shares of nine companies. Companies closed with gains, while 21 logged losses. In sectoral indices, 17 out of the 19 sectors closed with losses. In the global equity markets, Asian stocks gained as the U.S. Federal Reserve committed to maintain a accommodative monetary policy. Hong Kong's Hang Seng jumped 1.3 percent. Japan's Nikkei 225 climbed 1 percent, and Singapore's Strait. Times surged 0.9 percent. South Korea's Kospi rose 0.6 percent, and China's Shanghai Composite Index added half a percent. European stocks were mixed in intraday trade. Oil prices declined for a fifth consecutive session amid increase in U.S. crude inventories. In intraday trade, Brent crude prices were trading around $67.80 per barrel. Back home, gold prices rose 40 rupees per ton grams at the multi. Commodity Exchange for April contracts. Gold futures was around 44,880 rupees per ton grams. Silver futures also rose 210 rupees to trade around 67,440 rupees per kilogram for May contracts. And at the forex market, the rupee appreciated marginally by two paise. To 72 rupees and 53 paise against the US dollar. Rajesh Lake for World News, All India Radio. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. Washington Post reports that on the eve of China summit, Biden administration subpoenas Chinese companies on possible security risks. Wall Street Journal writes that President Biden has pledged to rebuild ties with foreign friends. With a rising China and an increasingly nuclear North Korea, the Guardian reports that AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines may be more effective against Brazil variant than previously thought. The Globe and Mail writes that Turkey's Western allies are worried by move to ban pro-Kurdish political party, and Washington Post writes that a Baltimore restaurant owner drove six hours to cook a favorite meal for a terminally ill customer. A quick look at the headlines once again. India and Kuwait established joint commission to enhance and deepen bilateral relationship. European Union joins the coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure. Italy joins the International Solar Alliance. China and the US to conduct first in-person meeting under the Biden administration in Alaska. Swarnam Vijay Mashal, the victory flame of the Golden Jubilee celebrations of the 1971 Bangladeshi Liberation War, reaches. All India radio premises in Kolkata. India's Nikha Zareen stands world champion Ekaterina Polseva to enter the women's 51 kg quarterfinals at Bosphorus Boxing Tournament, and PV Sindhu beats Christopherson of Denmark to enter the quarterfinals of the All England Open Badminton Championships. India is celebrating its 151st birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Before we end, let us listen to his favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan, by artist from Mongolia. And with that, we end this bulletin. See you at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News.